special episode of Royals Weekly. I am your host, Marcus Mead, and joining me as always, I didn't come up with a funny joke for this, but he's my brother, Mike. The Rule 5 pick of Royals Weekly, me! <laughs> Yay! Uh, all right, you. you could be the Rule 5 pick. I mean, you. <laughs> you're older than most prospects, that's for sure. You are certainly older than most prospects. Um, yes, this is my brother, Michael Mead. Uh, I am Marcus. Uh, thank you for joining us. We wanted to jump in with a special winter meetings episode of uh, of Royals Weekly. We were, we were looking at this as, in two ways. I was thinking, like, if the Royals don't make a Rule 5 pick, I'm going to need a platform for going berserk. Uh, and if they do, I want to talk about the Rule 5 pick. They luckily did. And so we'll have an opportunity to do that. You won't get to hear me truly lose my my myself uh, on on live recording. I, not live recording. On, on the air, if you will. Uh, but we will talk a little bit about who the Royals took in the Rule 5 draft today. We're going to talk about how they came about getting a, rule, a spot open for the Rule 5 draft. And we're going to talk about sort of how the winter meetings went for them in general. I think overall, I think you'd have to be like, uh, if, if a sound represented these these winter meetings, it would sort of be like, wah, wah. like that would be my, my, my vocal representation of the winter meetings generally. Mike, what are your thoughts on how things went down over these last three days here uh, for the Royals, especially, but major league baseball in general. Well, I, I actually just saw a thing online from, from Chris Rose, a guy that I, I like a lot. He, he put it a great way. The NFL and NBA free agency period is a mad dash and and fans get excited about it. The, the MLB winter meetings, you remember when they used to call it the hot stove? That That's not a thing anymore. That's that doesn't exist. The, the winter meetings are just brutal now. Nothing happens. And I heard somebody say, well, you know, everybody's waiting for Otani to sign and, and all that stuff. I'm like, if you're, you know, Lucas Giolito or Jack Flaherty, are, how does Shohei Otani's number affect you in any way? There's no, you're not in that realm. You're not, you're not in that, that universe. Like, I understand you want to be like, oh, well, if he gets a really big deal, my agent's going to fight to get more money. Well, who cares? Like, you know, I don't think that deal is affecting yours in any way. And so, yeah, it just it bothers me that that way of thinking like other leagues have to put rules in to stop teams from going faster. Yeah. MLB's like, ah, we'll just go real slow for the 80 year olds to keep up. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, we all get to go to the winter meetings and hang out because that's all we're really doing. That is all they're really doing. And, it, and it's sad because. The MLB is always looking for ways to keep people attracted to their product and they struggle with the notion of like making their draft. Are you, as big as are the you sure they are? Draft. Right. Well, I mean, they should be right. Like they should be concerned with how to keep people watching, how to do all that sort of thing. And and that includes in the off season. And of, you're right. Other leagues have deadlines in place and things like that to make it like a real moment when the off season is happening for them. Major League Baseball doesn't really have that. And it's, it's supposed to be the winter meetings. The winter meetings are supposed to be when things heat up and all that. But it just it didn't work out this year. It hasn't didn't really work out last year either. It just it, it's not. It's really it's a it's a. It's a real bait and switch almost on, on the fan base. Like, pay attention to the winter meetings. Here they are. We're going to have coverage. We're going to do this. And then it's like, what happened? Well, a reliever got signed yesterday. Woo woo. Like, nobody cares, right? Like, it, it's just not, none of the big names are off the board. This is really slow moving. And like you said, there's no good reason for it. It's not like it, Otani's number or these other contracts are really going to impact. We saw Sonny Gray go off the board. We saw all these other guys who have signed and yet others are just sort of waiting around. Like, I, I guess they want to wait till January to know where they're going to go. I don't know. Like, I don't really get the logic behind waiting until, you know, January or right before spring training for some of them uh, to see where they're going to go. It, it makes no sense to me, but if they want to make their product a little less interesting, you know, that's their prerogative, I guess. Um, we were a little bit, um, Frustrated, I would say, or at least I want to speak for you, Mike. I was a little bit frustrated to see the Royals uh, con continue to not do anything at these winter meetings, uh, especially yesterday when it came along and it started to look like, oh, man, they may have a full 40 man roster before they they uh, the rule five draft gets here. They waited, of course, until the very last minute to do something to free up a 40 man roster spot. But they were able to pick on the, uh, in the Rule 5 draft, and they, they took an interesting prospect. I want to talk about him. They took right-handed pitcher Matt Sauer. I'm going to say it's pronounced Sauer. I think it's pronounced Sauer. From the uh, Yankees organization, a six foot four right-handed pitcher. Uh, tapped out at AA last year, about 70-ish innings at AA last year. Mike, what are your thoughts on Matt Sauer as the Royals pick in the Rule 5 draft this year? 
I, I think he's an interesting pick. I think he's I think you're kind of betting a little bit more on upside versus the guy that we talked about a little bit, Tanner Burns. I think Tanner Burns has a little bit safer of a floor. Um, you know, if you look at okay, what's Matt Sauer's greatest outing? There's an outing out there where he pitched like eight innings and struck out 17 guys and walked nobody. Um, that's if you you know that's not what he is probably all the time. Nobody's that all the time. But um, I think the Royals are seeing some potential in there and hoping that they can develop. One, I think they're probably hope, thinking or hoping that there's still a little bit more velocity left in him after the Tommy John surgery that he went through, I think, in 17. Uh, he's back up to the mid-90s, but he was a guy that would get, uh, you know, touch the upper 90s before that. So they're maybe hoping for that velocity still to be in there somewhere. And then I think they're also hoping to improve another one of his secondary pitches. He has a pretty good slider, but I think they would like to improve the changeup. Um, probably not the curveball. From most of the things I've read about him, the curveball, I think a lot of people think is probably maxed out already, and it will never be even probably major league average. He doesn't throw it very much. Uh, I think does he throw a splitter too? Did I read that he throws he, a splitter? He finger? does. He does. He, he doesn't throw it very much either. And so, but he does have yeah. one. So it looks like maybe he they they are hoping on one of those other pitches they can develop that and keep him in the bullpen for now, and and then maybe a year late you know, next year or the year after see if they doesn't slide into the back of the rotation, but that's, that's kind of what you do with guys like Matt Sauer. So I don't think his floor is quite as high as some of the other guys were, but I think maybe there's a little bit more of a ceiling for him. And you like the strikeout numbers. The strikeout numbers are very good. Yeah. I saw a, a tweet out from Kyle Bodie the other day mentioning Sauer and saying that some teams just weren't sure about the medicals. They weren't really sure if, if, if that was the, or he thought the medicals for Sauer might concern some teams. And so uh, but there is a lot of potential there. There is starter potential. Those 70 some innings, I think he made 17 appearances and 16 starts last year. And so he is a starter. He had 100 innings pitched the year before that, 100 innings pitched for the year before that as a starter. And so he does have the capacity to see what's going to happen as he moves into the bullpen. Maybe that ticks up his velocity just a little bit. Maybe it helps sharpen some of his stuff. I think they would love it if he walked a little fewer fewer guys than he does. He's, you know, a, a walk rate, I think, around 10% right now. I think they'd like that down closer to 7 or 8%. Uh, but if they can do something to help him increase that velocity the way Cole Reagans did last year, then maybe they have something there for, in him. Or if, if they can't, they still might have somebody who is capable of being a back-end starter with the sharpness that he has on his slider, with his swing and miss stuff. Clearly, he can get uh, guys out via the strikeout, which is really what you're looking for. It's somebody who you're going to be taking potentially to be in your bullpen in 2024. Now, they will have to keep him on the Major League roster for the entire year. But high strikeout numbers, low walk numbers, the type of guy you sort of think might have the best chance to transition to Major League Baseball straight from AA. He did go to the Arizona Fall League and pitched in nine games there this fall. I think he had a very high ERA, something in the fives, but that's mostly the result of he gave up three home runs in 10 innings. And so he got bit by the home run bug in Arizona. Still had good strikeout and walk numbers. He doesn't give up a ton of hits either. That's what interests me. His opponent batting average last year was 189. And so you're talking about a guy who, yeah, while well, he walks maybe a tick more than you'd like him to, does not give up a ton of hits. And so it's weak contact. It's swing and miss stuff from his pitches. So there is a lot of, of ceiling there for a guy who you get basically for free in the Rule 5 draft. One of the things, just real quick, one of the things that I saw that I read about him was on his fastball. And they said that although he can get some swing and miss with it, that it is a fly ball pitch and he does throw it about 50% of the time. And so that could equate to some of those home run numbers. But you feel like it's going to always play a little bit better in a place like Kaufman when you see something like that. So that could have been something else they're looking at. Right. And one of the things that sort of often makes guys available in the rule five draft is, oh, they look like they're going to be, they're going to have home run issues when maybe it's just, you know, he got bit by the home run bug in this small sample or, you know, home run rates are pretty variable. We talked about this with Alec Marsh last year. There are some guys who are more home run prone, but generally speaking, home run rates can fluctuate a little bit year to year. And so maybe they can give him another pitch or maybe they can uh, teach him a way of, of, of operating with that fastball that will keep it from getting it out of the park. There are things they can they can do to work on that home run rate and try and ensure that he doesn't get uh, crushed out of the park too frequently. Uh, I will say this about Sauer. Uh, I think that there is some potential there. I think that 
it's interesting to see how he's going to fit into this bullpen because the pieces are kind of starting to take shape. You have MacArthur, McMillan, Anderson. Now we have to guess that Sauer will be in there all year. He's going to at least be given every chance to stick in the with the major league team. And so now you're seeing sort of four or five pitchers so you can confidently say, okay, they're probably going to be in this Royals bullpen. And it's looking like, okay, at the very least, that bullpen might have some upside if it may lack some consistency. I would imagine they look for consistency in that bullpen throughout the rest of this offseason, getting some guys who maybe have a little bit more of a track record at the major league level uh, in the bullpen. Speaking of that, and I didn't bring this up earlier, Mike, but the Royals did make a minor league signing. They signed a, they signed a guy named Dan Anavila, I think is his last name. I think is how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. um, he's a 31-year-old right-hander, a guy who, according to some, has been – He's been hurt for the last couple of years, but according to uh, reports, he had his fastball up to 98 miles per hour in the Winter League, in the Dominican Winter League, and had a dozen offers for minor league deals uh, to go pitch for other teams. I got to assume he took the Royals because he's going to have the best opportunity to make the team. There's a guy with a little bit more experience who has had some successful seasons relieving in the major leagues. Mike, do you have thoughts on how this bullpen is shaping up? Yeah, I mean, don't forget Carlos Hernandez in there too. Um, so you're hoping that he can take a step forward you know, to look like maybe he did in the, in the uh, world baseball classic um, and that they can get something out of Carlos Hernandez as well. I still think you have to like uh, the, the Dan, whatever his la last name is, uh, what's his last name again? It's okay. Like let's Anavila. say that uh, <laughs> he's the kind of guy and I put this out on threads. I think you invite, you know, you got to invite six or seven of those guys to, to spring training to see if you can get one of them or two of them to stick. Um, that's, that's just free. If any of them do, that's, that's found money. You know, you're, you're playing with house money there. If any of those guys stick. And then if one of them turns out to be something, you can trade them later on for other pieces. And so, yeah, I, I, I like that pick very much. I like that signing very much. I just wish they were doing more of that type of stuff. Yeah, and if you'd like a list of available minor league free agent pitchers who could work as relievers, I actually put one of those out on Twitter a good month or so ago. Uh, a big list of like 12 or so relief pitchers who the Royals could look into. Some of them are already signed, uh, but there are still other minor league free agents out there for the Royals to go out and take a look at uh, as relievers for this bullpen. At the very least, you get those guys on minor league contracts, have them stick in your AAA team for a while, and then you have a sh nice little shuttle going back and forth from Omaha to Kansas City. One of the ways they made room on the 40 man and in the bullpen pen for Matt Sauer and I guess Dan on if he ends up making it is the Royals traded Dylan Coleman today, a couple hours before the rule five deadline or the rule five draft happened. They traded Dylan Coleman to the Houston Astros for 19 year old right-handed pitcher, Carlos Mateo. Dylan Coleman, as you'll remember, had a pretty good year, not last year, but the year before that 2022 looked like he has serious strikeout stuff had troubles with walks. And then last year, his stuff took a step back as his velocity fell to 95. He had trouble locating even, even worse than the previous year. And he was really a train wreck of a reliever at the major league level last year. So the Royals trade him to open up a 40 man spot. Mike, what are your thoughts on Dylan Coleman and the return of Carlos Mateo? I was very surprised to see Coleman go because he has had he has had some measure of success at the major league level. There are three, four, five guys at the bottom of this 40 man roster, pitcher pitchers too, who have not, who have no track record of success in major league baseball and who are like you, you mentioned earlier in our last episode, are easily replaceable. They're replacement level players or worse. And I was surprised that they were they were willing to kind of give up on Coleman so quickly. There's reports that he's working this offseason on gaining that velocity back. It always felt like if he gains the velocity back, then even with some location issues, he's still going to be somewhat of an effective reliever. And so that that was a little surprising to me. But, you know, the Royals may be looking for – maybe they feel like he'll never throw enough strikes. Maybe they feel like even with a velocity gain, he's never going to be an effective relief pitcher. I understand that. I mean, maybe they thought, hey – and then and Josh Kaiser put it a good way. Essentially what you did was you traded Dylan Coleman for Matt Sauer and Mateo. If you start thinking of it that way, okay, now instead of uh, Dylan Coleman at some point being in your bullpen this year, Matt Sauer is going to be in your bullpen this year. And I think they see Matt Sauer as a guy that has a lot more potential than a Dylan Coleman. And so if I think about it that way, 
uh, it doesn't bother me so much, but it, it bothers me a little bit that they didn't think, well, we can get rid of a uh, Angel Zerpa or a, or a, a John Heasley or any of those other guys at the bottom that you don't feel like are probably have a whole lot of uh, big potential in major league baseball. See, I would never get rid of Zerpa for something like that because he can start in Major League Baseball. He pick, he picked yeah, it up really nicely that. at the end of last year. But Heasley, there are a few other guys who I may have considered instead of Coleman. Heasley being one of them, Colin Snyder being one of them, Josh Taylor being one of them. Uh, they've had Taylor especially has had injury issues, and that might be a, a factor there. I do understand the notion of making it Coleman if they think that that command will never come if they think and and they want to put a premium on not walking guys right like if if their pitching staff's philosophy is going to be like we don't care if you're striking out 10 guys in uh per nine we don't care if your strikeout rate's super high as long as your walk rate is really low then a guy like coleman is never really going to fit that and so it wouldn't surprise me if, if they're like hey i don't know if the velocity is coming back i don't think the command's ever going to be there we should just move on from this guy and and maybe they feel better about uh, what Heasley's doing and that sort of thing. Heasley also working at tread uh, along with Dylan Coleman and Colin Snyder and guys like that. And so maybe they're seeing the numbers that they're seeing from tread and those, what those guys are putting out and saying, we don't think this is, is enough. We don't think it's worth it. We're going to try and trade in sour for Coleman and, and that sort of thing. One thing I will say that kind of supports that is you have to remember the Royals bullpen was one of the worst bullpens at throwing strikes last year. If that, if they're like, that's the first thing we have to fix, then Dylan Coleman doesn't fit into that. Yeah, he might not. And and what's interesting is, you know, I haven't seen, I mean, there was some video and stuff out. That, a tread will occasionally put out videos of these guys throwing in the offseason. And I feel like people put way too much stock into those. And it's like, yeah, he's throwing in the offseason. Everybody throws in the offseason. Everybody trains at these private institutions. We can't just assume that because Dylan Coleman went to tread this offseason, the way he did before last offseason too, that he's going to get, wildly better you know it's it, it doesn't work that way and so you know I, I i think it makes sense in terms of process i think the process here is right dylan coleman was a negative 0.4 war player last year okay you have to be highly transactional with those kind of guys you have to be willing to move on quickly from lots of these types of guys if you want to help i mean the whole conversation we're going to have here in a second around the draft lottery is Major League Baseball is designed for teams to try to turn themselves around quickly now. You can no longer take five years for a rebuild, okay? Because the game isn't set up for you to do that. And so you got to be transactional. You got to move on. You got to, you know, quickly, quickly, quickly move from these teams. I wish the Royals had also moved on from Heasley and taken two guys in the Rule 5 draft, honestly. I think that would have been a really effective. Could have been Matt Sowers and Tanner Burns, and we'd be like, whoa, like they, they, have, they have an opportunity here. They chose to only take one. But the notion of just hanging on to guys and hoping they get better and better and better is sometimes a little bit foolhardy, I think. I did also want to bring up one more thing, and I can't necessarily – oh, yeah, I just I just touched on it. Uh, the draft lottery. It was a little bit of a sad moment uh, on Tuesday. Mike, we're going to talk about it. Don't get too – despondent here uh the royals <laughs> being on on royals twitter for that moment was just messed up honestly uh the royals <laughs> participated in, in major league baseball's second ever draft lottery you'll remember last year they had what i think the best odds to get the fifth overall pick or something like that they had the fifth worst record in baseball they ended up with the eighth overall pick this year they had the best odds they had odds to get the best uh pick the number one overall pick tied with two other teams and they ended up with the sixth pick in the MLB draft. Uh, second worst record, they end up with the sixth overall pick after the Major League Baseball draft lottery. Mike, what are your thoughts on what happened that night, where the Royals were picked, and all that? Well, you know, part of it is that Major League Baseball, the Major League Baseball draft has a lot more to do with your ability to identify talent and project talent than it does where you're picking because the, the, the variable, there's just so many variables. It, it just doesn't, it's not like the NBA draft. It's not like the NFL draft, but it's always better to pick one. <laughs> than yeah. Six. Yeah, now, it, is. it is. Now the thing with me, and it's hard for me to get too pissed because the Royals have had Top 10 picks. How many times have the Royals picked in the top 10 since 2010? A lot. Almost every year. Okay. It's almost every year. 
And the things they have done with those picks are so bad that I can't get mad about this until like, I, I know like pick one, pick six, the Royals are likely to blow it either way. If you're looking at recent history right now, I hope that isn't the case. I hope there's been change. I haven't seen any evidence of change. <laughs> I can't, I can't say that's the case, but I just, I was on my drive home from work today. I was just rolling through the names, you know, in my head, the Christian Cologne, the Kyle Zimmer, you know, the Luke Hochaver, the one time we did pick one, one. Um, and I mean, there's so many more, there's so many more, the Ash Russells and Nolan Watsons, the, I mean, I'm talking guys, you didn't Starling. Get. Asa Lacey, Bubba Starling, Aaron Crow was picked 12, I guess, uh, you know, like Frank Mazzucato. These, these are for, yeah, I mean, now Mazzucato books, could still have a chance here. Of book's course, still out on him. Yeah. But, book's still out on him. Yeah. But gosh, it's just, it's hard for me to get too pissed when I, when the thing that really gets me is even when given the sixth pick or the eighth pick or whatever, you're not making the right moves. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and and I can't get too upset about it either. I, I guess there's just like a general sense of injustice or not injustice. It's more like cosmic yeah. injustice, right? Which is like, hey, of course, the world always craps on the Royals, you know, like, um, but I, I can't be mad at Major League Baseball for doing this either, right? Like they, they're trying to get to a system where there's more parity in the league without doing the one thing that would actually create more parity in the league because they can't do it, right? They can't institute a salary cap which would create more parity in the league, but they would like more parity in the league. So they put all in these, um, like, uh, these luxury taxes or whatever, if you pay so much in salary, you get taxed a whole bunch to try and keep payrolls down to some degree, sort of a false, a faux salary cap. Right. And then they say, Hey, we don't want teams tanking for five years to get the best draft picks. So they can, they want teams to try and compete and be competitive. This is their way of doing it. Right. It's the Royals' fault that they've been as bad at drafting as they have been and gotten to this situation, right? It's their fault for that, okay? And it is, we should also be a little bit softened in this in that it doesn't matter that much whether or not you're picking second, which is what they had the actual record for, the second worst record in Major League Baseball, or sixth. Look at the Rays. They, they haven't picked in the top 10. How long has it been since they picked in the top 10? They're still a great team. They still develop. They still have a great farm system. Look at the Dodgers. How long has it been? So now they spend a bunch of money, but how long has it been? So they have a great farm system, despite the fact that they don't, they don't ever pick in the top 10, right? It's really more about I, talent acquisition and development than it is about where you're picking. And so if the Royals are truly getting better at identifying the talent, that's going to help them identifying the talent that has potential that they can develop, then really that's going to determine. Does it still kind of suck? Yeah, it still kind of sucks. But ultimately, it's nice to know that if the Royals are heading in the right direction, those four different, those four slots won't make that much of a difference. Mike, do you have any other thoughts? I did want to talk a little bit more about there. There are reports out that the Royal or that uh, Eduardo Rodriguez will make his decision tomorrow on whether what team he's going to go to. Or it's, it's reported that he's narrowed it down to two teams. The Royals were at one time reported to be a part of of his considerations, though we don't know what those two, who those two teams are. What are your thoughts on the Royals and whether or not they may or may not get Eduardo Rodriguez tomorrow? You think that's a possibility? How remote? I would be shocked and elated if they did. I don't see them getting Eduardo Rodriguez um, because he he's going to cost a good chunk of change, and the Royals, generally speaking, are going to get outbid if they're competing against any team. Let's be honest. Now, J.J. Piccolo did come out and say that they have roughly $30 million to spend. Maybe they, maybe that's something that they can get, you know, that you can probably get him for under $30 million a year, but it's going to be close. <laughs> and then yeah. that leaves you with not much else, probably, if you get Eduardo Rodriguez. So um, I don't think they're going to be getting him. Uh, I, I think they're more in the, in the just below him range. And, and honestly, I'd probably prefer them in the just below him range so that they can then go out and either get a second guy. That's a cheaper reclamation kind of guy for the rotation because they need two guys. I mean, you need two, at least two guys in the starting rotation and they just, you know, signing him probably doesn't give them the flexibility to go get somebody else or the, uh, the somebody else you're getting is a real, real uh, long shot. So um, I don't see them getting him. But maybe if that's maybe that signing is the one that tumbles the others. And so you start to see the Giolitos and the Flaherty's and the 
uh, Blake Snell and, and those other guys start to go, but uh, I don't see it happening. Yeah, I, I hope at the very least the Rodriguez signing, whoever he signs for, and maybe it will be the Royals, I have no idea. Um, I hope whatever that does, it sort of kicks off the action of this offseason because I think people are ready to know who what this Royals team is going to look like in 2024. I have a little bit of concern that their the starting pitching depth would be too shallow if they went out and got a guy like Rodriguez. I'm much more a fan of taking the approach that's like, I'll take a guy like Seth Lugo and Martin Perez or, you know, uh, any other combination of, of those uh, mid-tier starters. But, you know, Rodriguez would be great to have on the team. It just might not in any yeah, way it would. Uh, be sufficient depth in the starting rotation to uh, to keep the Royals uh, solvent when their inevitable pitching injuries and ineffectiveness, ineffectiveness come. But anyway, we'll, we'll keep our eyes on that. I'm not going to come back with another special episode if they sign Rodriguez. So this will be all you have to you have to deal with if they do end up with him. But uh, we hope to see you back here in roughly one month, a uh, little bit less than that now. Uh, we're going to uh, tune out now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Be good to each other. And go Royals. <laughs>